Hi. Good to see you. Yes. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we get to talk about coping with conflict, but before we do that, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife, and I have a private practice in Chicago, um, but I do a lot of online teaching and coaching um, specifically around how to have more intimate partnerships and specifically passionate relationships. So I do a lot of work around sexuality and intimacy. And my, I wrote my dissertation on Latter-day Saint women and sexual agency. So I do a lot of work within the Latter-day Saint community, but also just um, kind of conservative Christian um, beliefs that can impact sexuality and freedom within one's life. And so a lot of my work centers around helping people within those frames to uh, make sense of their lives and relationships. Yeah, which is important work, very important work. So today though, we're gonna talk about coping with conflict. And you know, often people say that, you know, they don't want a conflict in their marriage. And, yeah. uh, and you know, I've, I've heard you say that contempt undermines marriage, but not conflict. So can you explain mm -hmm. what you mean by that? Sure. So I think, and you know, again, coming from some of the religious perspective sometimes you know this cannot happen anywhere but where there's this idea that if you're happily married you're just floating along seamlessly in pure bliss at all times or else something's dysfunctional about you and your marriage <laughs> okay and so a lot of times we have these super idealized ideas about how marriage is supposed to go and what that does is sometimes if people are trying to achieve that external picture that a lot of um conflict or difference is getting kind of shoved down, shoved underground to avoid the overt conflict. But what's happening is a lot of resentment and contempt is emerging. And so contempt, which is hostility, whether that's overt or covert, is very hard on a marriage. That's resentment, that's, that's anger, that's a feeling of being trapped in your marriage. Um, conflict is more what I think of it is a natural outgrowth of two different people trying to forge a life together. Because when you fall in love with someone, you tend to fall in love with someone who's different than you, not different in every way. Like hopefully they share some core values with you. You know, there's going to be things about them that you have meaningful similarities, but often extroverts are drawn to introverts, right? Spontaneous people are drawn to more uh, methodical people because we like that balance. I think there's actually something very um, productive about creating a partnership where you bring differences and capacity for good parenting, for good living. The problem is because we like to do things like we like to do them, like we want to be partnered and have this person love and admire us at all times, but we want to do the things the way we want to do them. We don't want to subjugate ourselves to somebody else. And so in, almost immediately post honeymoon, okay, there is going to be the confrontation with difference. And so if you're going to create a meaningful marriage, you have to tolerate the inherent conflict that's gonna happen when two honest people are trying to build a life together. A lot of people handle that contemptuously, which we can talk about, and that's always going to erode the foundation but the conflict is natural to some, trying to create something honest. How you handle the conflict, John Gottman talks about this, David Schnarch talks about this, how you handle the conflict is really central to whether or not you forge a, a happy marriage or you forge one that is dishonest or resentment-laden. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I couples often get into patterns early on because yes. of being so opposite and then they blame each other for absolutely the behavior they took on to cope yes. with the disagreement right that's right and that's what you're talking about with the contempt that's right and a lot of times these are sort of balanced systems I was just hearing the tail end of the last presenter but I think that's what she was speaking to a little bit is you know a lot of times one is dominant and trying to manage the difference by getting the other person to yield and often the person on the other side kind of manages the anxiety of difference by yielding 
And so that can be a kind of balanced system, but one that will is designed to fail ultimately. It will create too much resentment and anger on both sides. But yes, it often appeals to the worst in us and then those can get solidified in marriage. Right. And it's and it's scary to be vulnerable. I mean, everybody entering into marriage, you're you're putting your life in somebody else's hands that's and right. the, the component of vulnerability that's that is fearful, right? And that's right. being brave and taking the step to put your heart out there. And so instinctively, we'll often go to patterns, which, you know, we've seen our parents do, we've seen other people do. So in the face of that anxiety, it's easy to just go and repeat patterns of coping without even knowing that you're doing something that's dysfunctional. Right, right. Yeah, I I often say that the people, when they just get married, they, they need to about six months, one year in, do intensive couples counseling, even if things are going well. Yeah, <laughs> because you can set yourself up for success long term. Because that's right, we get so far into it, we've we've really bought into our system. That's and, right, and we are we ends up being destructive. So that's right. Why do you think most people conflict, or some people conflict poorly? Well, so I think because of these patterns that we've learned. I, speaking to what you said, the avoidance of vulnerability. I was just working with a couple this morning where he was, you know, feeling so much gratitude for his wife in the morning when he woke up. He's not a man who shows the underbelly easily. And after she woke up, instead of sharing how much gratitude he felt about the fact that she was in his life, he made a move to diminish her. Okay. Now, he grew up in a family where one does this, okay? In the face of vulnerability, you get on top, okay? So he's doing what he knew. But it's also because it's scary, as you say, you're turning your happiness over on some level. I mean, you, you still get to drive your decisions. But yeah, when you say you're going to join your life with somebody, you are, you are, and let them really matter, you are turning over some control over things that really matter to you. And so a lot of times in that desire to preserve ourselves or to make ourselves feel less vulnerable, we will do less honest, less exposed, less open-hearted things to manage some of that. The other thing is, you know, like I was saying, we want to belong to our partner and to the people that matter to us, but we also want to be able to do life the way we like doing it. So a lot of times we'll do these overt or covert things to try and get the other person to yield to our reality because we want them in our lives but we want to do things as we want to do them and so the difficulty is we need their approval them yielding too much to manage our sense of self and so a lot of times it's in that dependency on them to have them yield to you feel good about you be happy with you that interferes with a kind of core honesty in the marriage that, you know, so we're often looking for these like loopholes instinctively away from the growth that an honest marriage pressures in people. Yeah, absolutely. And for people who've been with us all day, they've heard a couple couples talking. And, and if you think back to those interviews, you can remember how honest and open they were just even in their interview. So mm -hmm. That's a, a huge point that you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. That's right. So um, how can you start to recognize unproductive patterns in your relationship? So, you know, one of the things that in, I teach online courses and one of the things I talk about, this is a Terry Real idea of looking at losing strategies. So when you're up against your frustration in your marriage, you're frustrated with what your spouse is doing, or if you're not married, what your parents are doing, your children are doing. What do you do that, you know, if you're 35 years old and when you do it, you feel any a day younger than 35, you're regressed on some level. Okay, so it's these kind of indulgent behaviors. Some of them might be that you holler and scream. Some is that you play victim, you know, poor me, poor me. I can't believe all the ways people take advantage of me here. Sometimes you might just yield but resent and expect or hope that they're going to come back and appreciate you later or value you. So there's just, you want to look at what do I do when I'm up against that uncomfortable, frustrating place in a marriage with my child that I know is a little bit weak 
and it pulls for something indulgent in my spouse. It pulls for something immature in my child. So you know it feels immature on your part and you know that your spouse is not going to come back more constructively. You're actually goading them into something unconstructive, non-constructive. So it takes some self-awareness and some honesty in my courses. I ask people to kind of pull up some of these examples and then write out, what did I do? What did my spouse do? Because when you're in it, you're just in it and you're long for the ride in some ways. <laughs> you're like, you know, you don't even, you're just playing it out. And then you're looking at the, the, the wake of destruction behind you afterwards. So if you can kind of stop and look at what you're doing and then specifically how your indulgent behavior actually invites your spouse into indulgent behavior, right? Like when you get demanding and controlling, they get resentful and accommodating, but they don't want to have sex with you. Okay. So you know what I'm saying? Like they're angry at you and they're making you pay, for example. So you want to look at the more that I do this, the more my spouse tends to do this behavior that I really hate. And the more my spouse does that behavior that, that I really hate, the more I tend to do this other thing. So you can start to decode a kind of dynamic or a system that gets repeated over and over. And I promise you, you probably do this over and over and over in your life. So it shouldn't be too hard to see technically, although we're very good at being blind to ourselves. If you can't figure out what your, what your bad behavior is, ask your spouse. Ask your child. They know. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be happy to let you know. Uh, but you want to look at, you know, or look at the negative behavior of your spouse and think, how do I make it easy for her or him to justify this in themselves? How am I a part of their justification of this indulgent behavior? Some people overfunction, run in and solve everything all the time, and then they complain that their spouse is lazy and underfunctioning. But they're a part of that systemic reality. And oftentimes, this I'm sure you know, can be tied back to um, somebody in your family of origin. Yes. You happen to pick a spouse that either reflected your family of origin in yeah. part or a compilation. Of That's people, right. Right? That's so right. When you react poorly, there's that component of recognizing, okay, this is, I probably have more heat behind this. Yes. This That's isn't right. just about my spouse. That's right. Absolutely. These kind of regressive patterns. And they're very much, you know, like I grew up with a father who was quite introverted and quiet and didn't compliment readily. And when I talked to my sisters, I would say, oh, I'm going to marry an extroverted guy that gushes. And well, I dated guys like that. And they were like, not that interesting. <laughs> then I meet my introverted husband and I'm like, oh, he's everything. <laughs> And, and so then when he was slow to compliment or slow to acknowledge something, it, would, it wasn't just, oh, I'm married to an introvert. It would, it would feel the pain. It would link to the pain of something that I had wanted as a child and didn't get enough of with my dad. So, so then you're bringing it all to your spouse like it's all their problem. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and so, and again, that vulnerability, it's so healing for a marriage when you can share that story. Yeah. When you can parse that out, when you say, yeah. oh, you know, we, people use the word trigger, I triggered and you know, it wasn't just about you. Yeah. <laughs> and also I deliberately chose this person, like the people that I, you know, rather than I'm a victim of this person, no, there's something here that I wanted mm -hmm. and learning how to handle my sense of self and hold on to my dignity and so on in this partnership is part of my work. So don't make it all about them. What do I need to do to, to develop something in me around this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So do you have any um, tricks or tips for uh, engaging when you're in your worst state? Mm -hmm. Like what do you do in that yeah. moment? Well, one of the things is, you know, as you say, you know, when you're triggered, when you're in that pattern and you're up against, this is a Terry real term, you're up against that crunch of just like, oh, you know, my spouse is doing exactly the thing that drives me crazy, that makes me feel so out of control of my own happiness. Or the, Those are very bad times to try to work things out because you're in a regressed place. And John Gottman talks about this, but you know, you don't want to try and solve it from that state of mind because you're you know, your limbic brain may mean every word that you say in that moment, but your higher reasoning will regret it later and nothing constructive will follow. So the first thing I think, and I say to the people I teach is that the first thing you want to do 
is calm down. And if that means leaving the, the scene of the conflict and saying, I'm, I'm regressed, I'm overwhelmed, don't, I've said to my kids before, don't listen to anything I'm saying right now. I'm off the rails. <laughs> I'm trying to get it together. <laughs> okay. Um, that you just need to give yourself a pause and, and not like a pause to avoid dealing with what's happening. A constructive pause that allows you to go pull your brains together and come back in a constructive place. The next thing I'd say is, is part of calming down, I think these two are kind of two sides of the same coin, is self-confronting. What often gets us super worked up is when we feel out of control and when we have put it that my spouse, my child, reality is running me, we feel way more triggered, way more overwhelmed, way more regressed. And the thing is, we are a part of our decisions. We don't have as much control as we might like, but we always have control over who we're going to be or what we're going to choose in the next moment. And so I think a very valuable thing is going on a walk and then asking yourself, how am I a part of this problem? What is my role in this issue? Now, if you can name what you see your spouse or your teenager or your sister, whoever it is doing, you can acknowledge what you see, but you want to quickly get to how do I make this easy for them? What is my role in this? What would it be like to live with me? Okay, that's not a, always a fun question. You know? <laughs> and, so, and you know, wh how would I be a hard person in this moment? Why would it be easy to do what they're doing, right? Um, because what you're trying to do, when we're in our worst selves, we're down in the trenches and we only see our side and we're just fighting to, to triumph or to prevail. The wiser is to get into the third view, to bring your intelligence up. Like Einstein said, you can't solve a problem at the level at which the problem exists. You have to increase your intelligence. So it's calming yourself down enough to get your brains back together and then try to get to a higher view. How am I operating in something dysfunctional? How am I operating in something immature? And what is my role in increasing my functioning here? I can't control them. I can control who I am. And this is easier said than done, especially when you know the pattern. And, you know, I know with like my own teenager, I would try to change things and then they just double down on the behavior where I'm kind of weak. And then I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm back into my behavior. <laughs> right. And so it, it, but the more, you know, the more you do it, the more you kind of keep confronting your own part, the stronger and the better you get. And when you pull your functioning up, I think much like the last presenter was saying, the other person really kind of has to pull their functioning up to stay engaged with you. Right. Often the first move is to try to pull you back down and it's an easy move to make and it's an easy one to fall into. But if you can deal with who you are, you know, my courses are very much about you dealing with who you are because that's the piece you have control over and you at least have your self-respect at the end. Another trick I have is if I'm feeling kind of like I'm getting sucked into something and my brain wants to you know, show others where they're wrong or something like that to, instead of trying to control others or get others to see something, I will ask myself, what do, who do I need to be? What do I need to do to respect myself at the end of this? That's the only part I have control over. Uh, you know, at least one of us should respect me at the end. <laughs> And so, you know, that just pulls for me to, to engage my higher self, my more adult self, and not just go down that slippery slope of regression and self-justification. I like that, this idea of, you know, how will I, what do I need to do to respect myself at the end of this conversation? Yeah, that's exactly. great. Yeah. yeah. And indeed, you know, zooming out the lens, um, you know, you talked about, you know, looking down at like, like the high overview, you know, zooming out the lens of the situation and detaching from the emotion of it long enough to observe yourself. Yeah. Observe the, the dynamic. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 So do you have any other um, thoughts you want to share? I think you have a, a discount for us too. Yeah. Um, well, ju just what I would say is I think sometimes in our, you know, I grew up with very idealized pictures of what marriage was supposed to be. And how you were supposed to know when you found the right person that like gives you meet them immediately everything's blissful and then you go off in the sunset the only problem is i would look around and be like well nobody seems to be having that kind of marriage so <laughs> there's something messed up about this model um but i guess what i'm saying is i think sometimes we have these like ridiculously idealized ideas of what marriage should be movies don't help because they often end at the you know at the beginning of the romance not as people are working out their lives together 
-hmm. And so one thing I have to say is do not pathologize that process. It's an extraordinarily important, you know, marriage is a um, developmental institution. It, it gives you the architecture uh, or relational reality that will pressure your development if you'll let it. And it's not designed to be comfortable. It's not designed to be pretty at all times. And you're going to see things about yourself that you don't like. And at least, at least I have seen many things about myself I don't like. And that rather than pathologizing that, to be forgiving of, of ourselves enough, that as human beings, we are in development, we are in process, and you can become better, more solid, less reactive, more capable of love, more capable of intimacy, the more that you allow yourself to grow through a marriage. Mm -hmm. you know, how can I become better? How can I stop making my spouse responsible for my sense of self or my happiness? How can I be a kinder person? How can I respect myself more? How can I develop my sexuality, my peace with myself? Because the marriage shows you where you haven't yet developed. And you can't control anybody else, but you can certainly use the marriage to develop who you are and become somebody more capable of intimate friendship, intimate partnership. And I don't mean to say that every marriage uh, should stay together. I mean, because you can learn from it enough to know that it's no longer the marriage that you should be in if you're with somebody who won't grow or evolve or is abusive or anything like that. But, um, but much like the last presenter was saying at the end, if you really are addressing who you are and you're really cleaning up your side, it's unusual for a marriage to not evolve because you become a force to be reckoned with in the best sense. So I guess my, my, my last thought around that is just don't pathologize that process. It's a very valuable process. It's a sacred process in some respects especially if you bring your courage and your honesty and your humility to it by humility, not like I suck, but like, I'm willing to see what's hard to see in myself. I'm right. willing to acknowledge what's hard to see in the marriage. Maybe I want to make the marriage better than it is, or make my partner more honest than they are or something, but be willing to see what's there and allow yourself to grow into somebody who can handle yourself and the reality that you're in. Right. And one of the pieces of that that I just heard you talk about, you, you called it humility. Um, it's just that being okay, that, you know, allowing the grace of I'm not perfect. Yes. It's so often we, that's what trips us up. Yes, we exactly. We're not perfect. And then we get all kind of like protective, like. Oh, a hundred percent. And yes. the reality of none of us are. I did a podcast a couple of years ago on perfectionism and how it's, it's antithetical to intimacy. Because if we think somehow to be lovable or worthy, we have to be above the human condition, it will never work out for us. And, and so, so much of being capable of intimacy is not to live indulgently around your humanity, but to tolerate that human we all are and flawed we all are and in process we all are. So, yeah. So do you want to um, tell me a little bit about or tell our audience a little bit about the offer you have for them? Sure. Um, so we are, um, we, I have, um, five online courses and the strengthening your relationship one is a very good starter course the other courses have to do with developing your sexuality and intimacy as a couple sexual intimacy as a couple but the strengthening your relationship course is a lot of the things I'm talking about today how do you see who you are and how do you develop yourself in the context of a marriage mm -hmm. how do you see what your losing strategies are how you handle your sense of self vis-a-vis -vis your partner and it's designed to help you see who you are more clearly in the context of your partnership and give you strategies for growing into deeper integrity, deeper honesty, deeper courage, so that you can address conflict constructively, that you can ultimately create a marriage that where two people can thrive, where two people can belong to each other but also belong to the best in themselves. They can also pursue their goals and their dreams and be true to their better selves. So it's, uh, you know, I developed the course with an LDS audience in mind because that's sort of my primary uh, client base, but it's not, it doesn't, it's not about LDS theology. It's just 
sure. think, you know, I, I reference some Christian ideals in it, but it's really designed for anyone. And so it's currently 25% off of the normal price and you get six months of office hours with me where you and other participants can ask questions about how the concepts relate to your life. And so, um, so anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a great course. And so you can, I think there's a link somewhere, but you can go over there and get 25. Christian, yeah, Christian put it in the link in the chat. And of course we'll email it out too. And it sounds so valuable to have the office hours with you alongside yeah. that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so exactly. you have a couple questions. Are you okay taking a couple? Sure, questions? please. Okay. So we have somebody that purchased two of your courses. Can you see the chat? Um, let me pull it up. I think I can. Yeah, they put, these are in the chat. So uh, purchase two of your courses, but it hasn't completed them yet. And her yeah. question is more around coping with the marriage that has no, no oh, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. I have, my husband has a deep seated fear of emotional intimacy or fear of vulnerability. So he avoids both loving, caring gestures or statements to, and also avoids conflict. Absolutely. Won't admit that there's anything ever dissatisfying or lacking between us. Absolutely. Uh, today is our 20 year anniversary, but I still don't feel close to my spouse. Okay. This is a great question. Um, Sorry, I just want to see when I bring this up, he finds ways to divert, but if I press, he becomes angry. Absolutely. Okay. So this, you know, we tend to think of the negatively married people are, you know, the ones that blow up, they're reactive. Right. People who are underreactive are often just as unhealthy, right? They don't want to be honest. They don't want to deal. And so, yeah, th this is, this is somebody who is saying, be complicit with me. The husband is saying, be complicit with me in a low in an avoidant marriage, low intimacy, low honesty, so we can keep the peace and I don't have to feel exposed. I don't have to show who I am. I don't have to deal with who you are. Mm -hmm. And it looks nicer than it is because it's desperately lonely. It's right. fragile. Mm -hmm. um, these are the kind of marriages where everybody's like, oh my gosh, I thought they were so happy and they can crumble all of a sudden. What I would say is this is a marriage that needs more conflict. Okay, I know that sounds strange, but I think your husband gets angry, but I wouldn't let that push me back. I don't mean go in just guns a blazing, all right? I don't mean just be indulgently um, destructive, of course, but I think it means starting to name what you see. I think it means starting to be more honest. I have worked with couples that were conflict avoidant and fragile, and then they went through a year of kind of hell because there was more honesty and, and the conflict kind of came up and the resentment comes up and everything feels like it's going to fall apart. But then they start to settle down because they're creating a marriage on a foundation that's more honest, right? So you, when you, have, you build your house on a rock, you have a chance of creating something stable. But a lot of people have a dishonest foundation and it crumbles. So you have to kind of destroy enough to develop something based on what is real. But it means, you know, that destructive process hurts. It means some things falling apart. Your spouse's validation is what he's saying, like, don't go there or I'm going to make it uncomfortable for you. But you have to, in some ways, tolerate that invalidation. Maybe this person's losing strategy is kind of complying too much or just falling into that conflict avoidance also. So it's going to mean I'm willing to deal with what I think is really true and honest, not to hurt you, but to blow up the fantasy that we have that this marriage is happier than it is or more honest than it is yeah. and tolerating the discomfort that comes from that. But it's, it's a very good question. Right. It's, it's disrupting that system that they've. That's right. That's in, right. The new system. Right. That's right. And something healthier and more honest then has a chance to grow there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let, let's see, how do you break the pattern, especially the over-functioning, then complaining spouse? Then complaining spouse is under-functioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it depends a little bit on who you are in the system, but if you're the over-functioning one, um, you, you need to look at it not just like, I'm the strong, good one. First of all, there's often a fantasy that the under-functioning one is in fact weaker. And the over-functioning person is weak in the sense that, oh, I think we're out of time. They want to be strong. They want to be perceived as needed. And so that desire often drives them to um, go in and solve things and do too much. But then they are complicit in the spouse under-functioning. So it means challenging your narcissism in a way and your desire to be the solver. Um, 
and then I'll quickly say, if you're an underfunctioner, you have to confront that you're betraying yourself, even though you can get away with it in your marriage. But I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank I you. Think-